Lots of folks were in the first service, and this is a great looking service as well. And there are so many good things going on here, just like you've heard this morning that Clayton talked about and BJ talked about. We are in a wonderful time in this congregation. Seems like I've been saying that for years, but it's been really good. And uh, we are so thankful that you're here with us. There are so many good ministries that we want you to be a, a part of. And, and, you know, just from, I was thinking about this when Clayton was talking about the old nursery and the new nursery and how beautiful the new area is. We have so many new families and new families that have little babies and with some that are, have babies that are expecting uh, in the future. And we are so thankful for what God has done what God is doing, and we know that he's going to continue to bless this congregation. And that's, that's what we want to be as a congregation that knows how and looks into the future to say, how can we serve this community so that God be, is, will be glorified in the future days to come? This morning, we are talking about a walk in the orchard. Now, we've been walking through the orchard for a long time. Some of you are probably thinking, are we ever going to get to the other side? Well, this is finally the end of the orchard, okay? Keep walking with the Spirit, but we're finally at the end of the orchard. And today also may be your first Sunday here, and you're going, what are you talking about? Well, we are talking about the idea of walking hand in hand, step by step, with the Holy Spirit, with God, walking with Him. And the fruit of the Spirit are those things that we probably know well, or some of us know well, about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, that these are the kinds of things that we have in our lives. And so today, these are the things that we want to think about, obviously, what we've been thinking about the last few weeks. But this is what I want you to know. You, I hope you know this, but maybe it's new to you. But God wants good for us. Some folks feel like God doesn't want good. Some folks think God is bad. There are folks out there, but that's not the truth. God does want good. Do you remember all the way back in Genesis chapter 1? God created the heavens and the earth, and if, as you go through each day, each day at the end says, and it was good. It was good every time. It doesn't say, and God made the animals so it would be bad for humans. It doesn't say that, right? And God made the sky so it would be bad for humans. It does not say that. Instead, it says, it was good. God wants good for us, and God wants us to do good as well. However, many of our desires bring burdens rather than blessings. Things that we think are so important, things that we dwell on and think about sometimes. Oh, if I could only have, and you can fill in the blank. Sometimes it's the things we think about in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's the things we think about in the middle of the, of the morning. Oh, if I just had X, whatever that is, everything would be fine. And sometimes those are devious things, and sometimes they appear to be good things, but they turn into bad things. And so sometimes those things that are desires don't bless our lives the way we think they will at the moment that we are desiring instant gratification. But instead, they bring burdens on us that may last us the rest of our lifetime and may even, even last us through eternity. And so you say, well, what are you talking about, David? What, what are you talking about? Like, what are some of these things that you would be thinking of? Well, it's not what I'm thinking of, really. It's what's in the Bible that the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 5, in verses 19 through 21. He says, now the works of the flesh, or the sinful nature, are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, uh, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, that's quite a list there, isn't it? These are the things that we often desire, aren't they? These are the things that sometimes get us that we want, whether it be sexual immorality or our ambitions get so high that it's not ambition that's positive, but instead a selfish ambition. I'm going to run over people and things and, or countries or whatever, and it's, it's a selfish, uncontrolled ambition. All these things turn into bad 
things, right? And all at once what is desired becomes a burden rather than the blessing, the blessing that we're looking for. And so what well, why? And maybe this is obvious. As I told the early crowd today, what I'm preaching to you today is what I might call a logical lesson. That does not mean it's easy to live. It's just logical, okay? Like immorality, for example. You take immorality, it can lead very quickly to heartache and even possible sickness. I'm talking about your heart is sick, but also even sometimes your body is sick because of immorality, because of things that come to us. Sometimes we're talking about diseases that come that way, but sometimes it is about the stress that comes because we know we are in relationships that we should never be in. Because we know we remember things that we have done. And so then heartache comes and sadness comes, relationships are destroyed, and it becomes awful. And all this that was going to be so great ends up plaguing us because we can't get it out of our memories. What God says is, stay away from those things. Stay away from that immorality. You take something like witchcraft. We may not be dealing with witchcraft too much in this congregation or at this moment, but you think about the problems that would come with practicing witchcraft or being close to it. A fear, an uneasiness, dark thoughts that come just by being around it. I don't want to, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I've known too many people in other places that have gotten close, and I don't, I don't want that. You think, you think, well, this will just be fun. I'll just stick my toe in and see what it's like. But instead of producing what we think it may produce, it produces negative thoughts and a negative life, or hatred and arguing and causing dissensions and factions and envy and those other words that are there bring us pain, don't they? They bring pain and sickness to us, literally physical sickness sometimes when we hate someone or we argue. And then we have factions and churches that divide and churches and families that divide and all the pain that comes through that hatred and factions and dissensions. I remember before I moved here several years ago of a family that had come to the congregation that I was working with and they were... They were probably in their 60s or so when they came, and, and they came from another congregation that wasn't too far away. And they, these were good Christian people, but their congregation had gone through what you've, you've heard this term before, a split. They were in a big fight in that congregation. And this family came to us, this couple, and they were, you know, they were friendly, and you could tell they'd been involved where they were. Matter of fact, the man may have even been an elder, I'm not sure, but they came and they were involved, and, and, and it wasn't... Long, we knew they'd come from a place where there had been issues. And it wasn't long until the man had to go into the hospital for, for a heart issue. And so two of the ministers, not me, but two of the ministers went to visit this man in the hospital. And he's in the hospital and he, they've done the surgery and they have the, the monitors and all he's hooked up to there. And, and the two ministers that were colleagues of mine, they're they talking to him and they oh, we're so glad you're here. And he's saying, oh, I'm so glad we're there too. And they have this friendly conversation. And then he says, but let me tell you about where we came from. And then he started, as they told the story, he started raising his voice and he started moving his finger and his hand and he was upset and ta telling the story. And all at once, all the monitors start beep, 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 all over the place. Nurses and doctors run in. And he lived. But it was easy to see scientifically what was happening to this man as the stress rose in him from what had been and was still around him. You understand how factions and divisions and arguing and hatred and all those things can be bad not only for our physical health but our mental health and obviously our spiritual health. All of these things can be big problems. He said, well, David, you've really convinced us today. We know this already, that all these things cause problems. But there is a great contrast. And the great contrast is in the next two or three verses right after this in the Bible. You've just heard from Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now I want you to hear Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Right after it. But, compared to all that stuff... 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Do you see the incredible contrast? Paul says in that first part, you remember, he says, I'm warning you, and he says, I've already warned you, now I'm warning you again. He's not writing to people who aren't Christians. He is writing the book of Galatians to Christians. So there were people who went to church and probably put their money in the basket or whatever they had or in the box. People who maybe were involved in ministries who were struggling with all those things just like they are in probably every church in the world. Not just America, but the world. Because people come with issues. We all have issues that we struggle with. And he says, I'm warning you. Those things will eat you alive. But if you want to know what it's like to be close to God, if you want to know what makes God's heart smile, if you want to know what is going to, to be good for you and is going to bring you to the promised land to live with God forever, then it's these really simple things. Love God, love others. Find joy in celebrating God. Have peace and patience. Be kind to people, to other people. Be God, kind to God's creation. Be good. Be faithful to God, to your family and to others. Be gentle in the way you treat others and how you handle yourself. Use self-control. All of these things can be very difficult, difficult because we all have buttons and some people just push our buttons, right? Some events push our buttons. Sometimes people do that. Sometimes it's words and thoughts or pictures or whatever it may be. They push our buttons. He says, use self-control and gentleness and kindness and all these other things. So this morning, if you want to relieve stress, and my guess is all of us would like to relieve some stress because we all deal with things, no matter who we are. But here's how to relieve a lot of stress. We have got to live by the Spirit. We have to walk hand in hand with the Spirit. You see, people who walk with the Spirit typically are better workers they have better relationships, they live longer, and they have hope. There are all kinds of studies across various fields that show these things to be true. That those people who are Christians and live by their faith, not just ones that fill out a, a form and say, I'm a Christian, but I mean the ones who live by their faith. That there are these things, well, why would they make a better employee? Well, first of all, they might be more aware of what's around them, but, but you also can know if you hire them, you don't have an employee that's going to steal from you. That's a better employee, right? If you are a business owner or you work in, you're in management somehow, you don't want someone stealing and you want someone working. Well, they're going to do that because they know that when they work, they're working as if they're working for the Lord. That's Bible. If they're living the way they're supposed to, that's what it will look like to be that type of employee. I'm going to give I'm going to give everything I can to my job through God, but give it to my job. They are, they have, they're better workers. They have better relationships. They should be happier at home with what's going on because they are living a faithful life, faithful to their spouse. They are faithful to their kids or their parents or to people around them. They're faithful friends. I mean, all those things are taught in the Bible, right? That's who they should be. They live longer, typically, we understand there is disease and sometimes people die early, we get that. But on the whole, we find out study after study shows us that people who live their faith live longer than other people. And you might say, well, why would they live longer if they're churchgoers? Why would they do that? Is there some kind of air they pump in to make us more, to live longer and to be healthier? No. It's that you will be practicing self-control on those things, or should be, and that will help you live longer. You will be living a cleaner life, not going to places where you would get hurt, but instead in a place where people will 
love each other and be kind to each other. And so all of these things show you will be better off if you live by the Spirit. If you live as God wants with love and joy and peace in those things, things will be better. People who walk with the Spirit put their hope in the eternal instead of the temporal. Do you understand what I'm saying? People who walk with the Spirit put their hope in the eternal instead of the temporal. Now, this is hard to do sometimes because we like instant gratification. We want it now, right? If you go on a diet, you want to lose weight today, 50 pounds by evening. That's the kind of diet I would like. We want it now. Whatever it is, we want it now. We want all of our, all of our feelings to be, to be gratified right away. So probably many of you in this audience have done what I'm about to talk about. Maybe not all, but many of you have. Maybe you were getting ready, for those of you who are married, maybe you were getting ready for your wedding day, or maybe it was for your child's wedding day, and you had purchased the clothes you were going to wear, your wedding dress or the mother's dress or the dad's suit, whatever, and it was a little bit smaller than what you are. And what you said was, I am going to fit into that, those clothes on that day, I am going to wear that dress or that suit that I've already purchased. I'm going to wear it. And what that means is that I'm going to have to lose weight between now and then. I'm going to have to be totally serious because this is like 30 pounds. I'm going to have to really concentrate on what I do. And so you are doing well. You're exercising. You're only, you've only eaten salad for the last four weeks. Yeah, haven't even put dressing on it. I mean, you have been serious about this, right? And then one day there happens to be a cheesecake right over here. And you see it there and you think, well, I can't eat it. That would be wrong. But how about if I tripped and my face fell into the cheesecake, right? <laughs> Back whenever I was, uh, after my senior year of high school, I worked at Dairy Queen one summer. And uh, we did not get a discount on anything except the dip cones. You know, you take a vanilla cone and you would put it into the chocolate and then you would pull it out and it's, and it's you know, hardened around it. And that would be the only thing we could have if it fell into the chocolate. I would pray, Lord, please bring someone in here who wants a dip cone. Because this was the plan. They would order the dip cone, I would put it in the chocolate, and then I would go like this until it would fall off. Oh, I have to make you another one, right? We'd do whatever we could to get the free food. Well, some of us sometimes, we end up sabotaging ourselves, and then we don't get what we wanted. We have to decide what is important. And so if you're wanting to fit into those clothes for that special event, you are going to have to decide it is worth skipping the cheesecake. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, with all of us who are dealing with things that are much more important than cheesecake and, and what we're going to wear to an event, we have to decide that this temporal gratification, whether it be sexual in nature or if it be something like, like I cannot wait to tell my boss what I think, I am going to let him hear every word I am thinking. Because you know if you do, or if you say it to your spouse or your kid or your parents, you know if you do what's about to happen, don't you? But for one split second, you feel wonderful. And then you may be trying to figure out how to file unemployment, looking for a lawyer to terminate your marriage. You may be looking for all kinds of legal assistance, trying, going into counseling, because you felt good for one second. Do you see how the Bible makes sense? Don't fall for the temporal. Hold on for what is eternal. Look for what is eternal and go for that. Because that's what matters. Now, obviously, we all fall short some days. We all sin. We all struggle. There is no one in here who, who gets it all right every time. But this is where we're headed. This is what we're trying to do. Produce fruit 
and just make it easier on yourself. I told you it's going to be logical, right? Produce fruit and make it easy on yourself. Your life will glorify God, and you will be so happy at your house, and it, you'll just keep playing the song, It's a Small World After All, and everybody will hold hands, and it'll be wonderful. If we all lived that way, that's what it would be like. When we produce fruit, we glorify God, and we make things better. When we walk by the Spirit, we can thrive. We can finally be in a place that I don't have to worry about my past. I don't have to worry about all these other things. I can just walk. I don't have to worry about covering up one lie with another lie with another lie. I can just walk because my word is my word. And while I can be upset, it's okay to be angry. The Bible says it's okay. Do not sin in your anger. I control myself when I deal with those things. Or I should control myself. We will never completely get rid of stress, even though we depend on God. There are things that cause us stress because there is only one person we can control. And we control them even, it's hard for that, we have to control with the Holy Spirit. So I can't control the things that happen in other places. If I have family or friends right now in the South, in North Carolina or in Florida or Georgia, Tennessee, I probably have some stress worried about my family that's there. I have stress because I know people who know people there. That brings up some stress. If I'm sick or my family is sick, there will be stress. I know. I believe in heaven and we're going to be with God forever. All those things. But it still brings on some stress. So why in the world do I need to try to bring in other stress? Instead, I need to eliminate all those things from Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Factions, envy, outbursts of anger, sexual immorality, all those things. I need to eliminate all that so that I can just depend on God and follow Him. Now I think about Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, famous passage of Scripture, where the writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He scorned its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to see this first part. Let us throw off everything that entangles. Maybe you've been to the beach before and, or watched people with kids at the beach. And one of the things that, that's interesting about little kids, you get a little boy, he's wearing his swimsuit and he, and he has a shirt on and mom finally says, hey, you can, run, you can go get in the water. And do you know what he does? He starts running and he throws that shirt off. You know, your little boy or someone else's little boy you see do this, he doesn't take his shirt off delicately and then fold it and then put it in a bag so everything is perfect and there's no sand in his shirt, right? That's not how he does it. What he does is he throws it off because he can't wait to get in the water. Because that's where he's going to thrive, is when he gets there. It's just like we are, right? This is what he says. He doesn't say, oh, well, what you need to do is stop and let's make a list, and tomorrow then you can start living for Jesus, he doesn't say, you know what, why don't you make a New Year's resolution in January and you'll have a few months to prepare yourself to get ready for that. That is not what this passage says. Throw off everything that entangles. Get rid of it today. Don't go home with it. Get rid of it today. That is what he's saying here. Get rid of it. Put your eyes on Jesus. So how can I withstand the storms and temptations? Keeping my eyes on Jesus. Not giving in to all the cheesecakes that are between me and Jesus, but focusing on Jesus all the way. Because Jesus makes it possible. It took a person to live a perfect life in order to be a perfect sacrifice. It's what was demanded by God. And so God, through His Son, does that Himself. He takes care of it Himself because none of us are perfect. And Jesus came and lived an absolutely perfect life without ever sinning, being tempted by all the things of Galatians 5, 19 through 21 and all the other temptations you can imagine and did not sin. Falsely accused, he then takes the sins of the world, my sins, your sins, 
and he takes them and is nailed to the cross for us. But before they nail him to the cross, they beat him twice. They lie about him. They do all kinds of things to try to to get at his psyche. And he does not give in. And he dies taking all the sins of the world. And as important as that is, none of that is completely fulfilled until Jesus, three days later, is resurrected from the grave. And now the portal is open and we can live with Jesus forever. We can have eternal life because the sacrifice was made. So this is my question. Will I thrive with the Spirit? You may say, I don't need the Spirit, I don't need God, and you are not going to make it. You cannot get through that portal without God. You can't. That's not me saying it, it's the one who made the portal saying it. We have to have God. He says, I will help you through these things. I am sort of convinced that we cannot stand up to temptation on our own. Only with the Spirit. I cannot do it by myself. And some of us say, when I get my life together, then I will be baptized and follow Jesus. You are never going to get it done, okay? Just let me tell you right now, quit fooling yourself. You are not going to get there. Because it's impossible, because the only way you can get there is to have the Spirit, and you can't have the Spirit until you're baptized into Christ and receive forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the key right there. So it's never going to happen on our own. We've got to have Him. So maybe you're ready to be baptized and start the walk. You can walk down here and you can be baptized into Christ. You can do that. You can talk to me afterwards. You can say, I don't really understand it. Would you study the Bible with me this week or next week? And I'll say, absolutely, yes. We can do that. Others of us, maybe we need to say, I did that and I am struggling. I am, I am full of temptation and I am giving in to temptation. I pray that you will pray that God will take those things away, that you will be strong. I also pray that you'll be talking to God about these things and as well as talking to someone else. We have lots of small groups. We have what men's fire teams where men talk about issues, that you will be in a place where you can talk about some of those struggles and God can work through those, those members of this congregation or maybe a counselor somewhere else to help you through those things. But we can get there. Because God made it so we could get there. And he is faithful and he forgives every sin every time. I need that kind of Jesus. I need that kind of Savior. Come this morning as we stand and sing.